Hi everyone, I'm Fiona Stock from Keep Up Copywriting. I'm an SEO copywriter and I'm really excited to introduce the Online Prosperity Show where we've been talking about all things chat GPT or as Prosper likes to call it now, chat GP yet. And I've also been talking about uh, spotting opportunities and changing careers, which may or may not be useful with all of this chat GPT stuff coming out. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And boy, do I have a good episode lined up for you today. All right. My name is Prosper. And in every episode, we try and bring um, the best of the best in their world. And today, I've brought you Fiona Stock. <laughs> Fiona, how are you doing today? Hello. I'm very well and very excited to be here talking to you. Absolutely. See, when we were talking earlier on, I just didn't know where to start because you are an expert in, first of all, copywriting and you've done a stint in management consultant and you were about to do a bit of belly dancing for me, but I had to stop you because we were recording <laughs> all of this just so that we can show our uh, audience what it is that we do here at Live Long Digital. So whether you're a seasoned pro or just getting started in business, I hope that this podcast is going to be the one that will help you start, scale and grow a business that's profitable and enjoyable. Now, Fiona, let's take stock of what's actually happening right now. Tell us a little bit about you and your call, call to action. What is it that you're actually doing these days? Yeah, so I'm a copywriter, an SEO specialised copywriter for small to medium service-based businesses in Australia. And basically I work with uh, businesses that offer a service to help them with all of their online words. So a lot of the time that's website copy. Um, it can also be blog writing. Uh, I also do a lot of writing uh, for social media and also reports and white papers and developing lead magnets. So lots of different things, but the thing that's common with all of them is it's small to medium businesses um, and they're service-based businesses. So they're people where you are the product and uh, it's all focused with SEO. So I've got the technical skills to make sure that you're making the most of Google, making Google happy as well as your clients. Fantastic. And obviously, you know, service providers, are usually giving advice and they usually just know more about what it is that they're uh, doing as opposed to the actual technicalities um, of the work that they do. So what, what do you find is the biggest, um, you know, drawback for people, especially when it comes to SEO? Because I also work within that space and a lot of people yeah. find it very difficult. Uh, a lot of yeah. people don't understand it. Um, how do you make it really sort of, easy for people to 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 sure grasp. well you know with my clients I think there's there's the SEO but there's the copywriting bit there's two things that are difficult and I think the key difficulty for people that are service providers is writing about yourself if you're the product you've got to talk about yourself and it's really hard to know for yourself what's your own unique selling point what's different about you what's special um we know ourselves pretty well, but it's really hard to write about yourself and people don't realise what it is that they particularly bring to the table. Uh, and a lot of people are really uncomfortable with blowing their own trumpet. So, you know, just having an external person actually talk to you and bring out what it is that's awesome about you and special about what you deliver is uh, really, really valuable. So that's the first issue that people face. And then, as you said, with the SEO, it is confusing. If you're not in that world, how on earth would you know about it? And, you know, there is so much information coming at you. You must SEO, you must do this, you must do that. And there's so much information, so many people in the business that people are completely overwhelmed, don't know where to start. I'm sure you know there's a lot of dodgy kind of SEO agencies out there um, trying to separate hardworking people from their money and they can make a real mess of things. I'm sure you've seen, you know, you've probably worked with clients where other SEO agencies have made a real mess. Uh, so, you know, my thing is I'm a really honest and straightforward person and I like to try and help my clients understand it and 
cut through it all and work out exactly what they need, what they don't need, because I'm working with people that don't have massive corporate budgets and they need to be doing the right things and not, not stuff that they really is extraneous for their business. Absolutely. So from what you're just saying there, Fiona, I'm understanding that SEO should actually just stand for simply educating others. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yep. Search engine optimization, simply educating others. Yeah. And it, it's so confusing and people get so scared about it. And and you know what? There's a lot of fear that people are fed by some SEO agencies that are saying, you must do this, you must do that, you must have a big budget. And it's just unrealistic and sometimes it's not the thing that's going to work for them the best. So, yeah, I, I'm all about education. I love, I love. well, you know, this is why I write. I love taking lots of information and making it understandable to your average person. That's what get, gets me excited. <laughs> I see. We were talking earlier on as well. And, and one thing about SEO, it's usually dominated um, you know, by males and most of them are usually people from overseas. How are you finding your stride um, sort of in this space and really cutting through the noise, um, which you seemingly are doing well, hence we're connected right now? Do you know, it's really interesting you say that because all of the S SEO experts that I know in my world happen to be females. Um, yeah, it's really interesting, you know, you know the people that you play with, you know, you know your own space. Um, for me, I work with smaller operators like myself, very often solopreneurs, and a lot of that work is all about connection and networking. So I'm not, um, I'm not looking to draw masses of clients. I only like to work, I, I like to do the work myself. I don't like to manage other people or outsource other work. Um, so for me, it's about connecting with people and seeing an opportunity for somebody who's got a question about what to do with business and what to do with SEO and, and just talking to them about some ideas that might work and then drawing them in that way. So I'm not really competing with everybody else. I'm just being helpful in my own little world and trying to expand that little world one connection at a time. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's one thing about, you know, SEO that that really intrigues me. They keep changing the algorithms. And I think <sighs> by the time by the time we finish this podcast, there's probably three or four different changed again. changes. And with the yeah. advent of technology, you know, how do you how do you keep up with the with the changes or is there some sort of strategy that you have found out yeah. that actually works and you just you know, you know um, maintain that for your clients? I think that um, you can't be an expert in everything. And I used to do a lot of social media, for example, and I'd write whatever people wanted me to do. Um, if they asked me to write Facebook ads, I'd do it. And I've started realising that I can't keep up with everything. I can't keep up with the constant changes in social media, what works with Reels, TikTok, etc. I can't keep up with Facebook ads or Google ads. I'm just focusing on keeping up with SEO. And the way I do that is to just have my ears to the ground, you know, link in with other people in the uh, industry, listen to what they're talking about. There's a couple of big players that offer lots of information. I'm always reading about it, reading blogs about it, reading announcements about it and listening to people that know more than me. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot, for example, a lot of the social media platforms or the people, the um, SEMrush and places like that, they are the experts. They're the ones that actually monitor what's working, what's not working and have the statistics behind it. So it's really helpful to actually read stuff that those guys, those companies are writing. And it's not just opinion, it's actually fact-based. So yeah, it's it's a job to keep up with it though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you see, what, what I did was um, I, I, I looked at where this whole bandwagon was going and I was like, um, I'll catch up with it when when I can. All right. So within my business, this is how I operate. I discovered that marketing is pretty much really discovering who your market is, discovering mm, mm. what message you want that market to hear and then determining what media is most suited to pass yeah. on that message to that market, okay? So SEO can be a medium. Video yeah. can be a medium. Um, yeah. this, this podcast in and of itself. 
is a medium, you know? So once I sort of discovered that I went on and started finding how I can get my clients to understand that and uh-huh. SEO will then take care of itself because people come to the internet to get information. All right. So with, with what you have sort of, um, you know, said and, and you keeping up with the SEO trends and everything else, does that mean your work or working with you is expensive? Well, look, I, I think I'm reasonably priced. I am not cheap and I'm not overly expensive. I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, but, you know, a lot because I'm doing copywriting, it's not just technical stuff that you can just whack out really quickly. It takes time and it takes a lot of thinking time and processing time and effort. So my fees are a reflection of the fact that this stuff takes time as well as expertise. I'm not expensive to work with, but it's, you know, it's probably the equivalent of working with a website designer. It's not ridiculously expensive, but it's not going to be cheap. But if you want cheap, you get results that really you're going to have to do again. Yeah. (laughs) You 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 know, what you're saying about the the SEO stuff and and, um, looking at different kind of things, yeah, you don't have to be an expert at everything. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. You've got to find the thing that works for you and flog that. You can be on one social media channel. You can just rely on blogs to bring traffic in. You can have a particular way. You've just got to do one thing well. Um, And, you know, sometimes one thing I've learned is if you try and do something that's just not you, some type of marketing thing that just doesn't, doesn't gel with you, it's not going to work. I remember (laughs) years ago um, when I had another business, I hired a coach, um, which was good experience, but she was trying to get me to do a lot of different things that at the end of the day I was really uncomfortable with. One of the things she told me to do, this was back before SEO and a lot of internet stuff, I was supposed to go out and um, leave flyers in coffee shops advertising my dad's business because it was a local dance school. And I said, yes, I'm not an extrovert. And for some reason, I really, really hate going and asking people if I can leave flyers in their shop. It's just a phobia of mine. I found myself paying big bucks to tell this lady that I had done it when I hadn't. I was lying, paying to lie to my own coach (laughs) because I was that uncomfortable. And it was, you know, it was this light bulb moment. And I thought, you know what? I don't have to do this just because it works for someone else. It's clearly not going to work for me because I can't do it well. But what I was really good at was sitting behind a screen and writing blogs that were bringing in lots of traffic to my website and I was getting business that way. And I thought, well, I don't. you don't have to be good at every type of marketing. You have to be good at one type of marketing or two. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's something else. And, and and I'm glad that you found your own stride in that because at the, <laughs> end, of, at the end of the day, exactly. So many people uh, waste so much money in, in marketing and, you know, on mm. platforms which are not quite related uh, to the type of work that they're doing just because they've seen their competitors yeah. um, working on those things. You see, in my culture, we've got this statement that no two fingers on the same hand are of the same height. So just because mm. it's working for someone, it doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, that it, it's going to actually work for you. And yeah. you see, through this writing of these blogs and you really trying to get the results that you <laughs> you were paying, is that is that then how the whole copywriting, um, you know, phenomenon now becomes solid in your head that this is what I'm supposed to show up in the world as? Yeah, well, you know, I always liked writing as a kid. And before this episode, I told you about my career path, which went from business consultant or management consultant, which was in business strategy, big corporate job. The next thing I did was become a professional belly dancer. So clearly no relationship there. (laughs) After that, I became a kids party planner and I had a party planning business. And then I became uh, an incursions provider, school workshops. And then I went into digital media, but, and, and now copywriting. But the thing was through all of this I've worked for myself for over 20 years I'm a one-person band I like doing everything myself so I was always doing the marketing myself 
Um, I always loved to write as a kid, but I didn't want to be a novelist. I don't have the patience to write a whole book. So blogging and website copy is perfect for me because it's short and sweet and it suits my writing style. But I kind of got into it because I was doing this stuff for myself and my own business and then I would be asked to do the same for other people. And then I worked with a marketing person that would get me to do all the copy work that she was selling to clients. And then I started my own business. So it's something that I've been doing along the way in my own business and then a little bit for others. And then I went, you know what, that's what I want to specialise in now because I enjoy it and I'm good at it. Fantastic. Now, you, you, you've you done quite a lot and the <laughs> most intriguing thing, remember, I want I think to- I've had the world's weirdest career path. <laughs> Absolutely. And for us to introduce this show, you're going to have to do a bit of belly dancing for us. So yeah. that's, that's <laughs> you know, the... I retired a while ago. <laughs> but but what's really interesting for me there, Fiona, is can you just maybe describe the purpose of how you see new opportunities? Because you came from that management consulting to that belly dancing to that party planning. Mm. How do you see that this is something that would actually work for for you? Because a lot of people are holding on to something just because they either graduated from school yes. from it and they are not really, um, you know, fully um, utilizing their their capacity or capability. Yeah, yeah, or doing things that they're really passionate about and interested in. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, you know, I think I nowadays I'm not so scared of change and I'm willing to try new things and leap, but... Originally, I think that was forced on me. I was a, so as a business strategy consultant in one of the big global firms, I absolutely hated it with a passion. It just was not me. But I did that for over six years because it was my first job out of uni. It was what smart girls were supposed to do. And I was scared, like everybody, of just making a leap and doing something else. I was made redundant when there was the dot-com bust and thank God for that. <laughs> you know, it was it was the the thing that I needed, the push I needed to get out and consider what else I could do. And I fell into belly dancing because I couldn't work out what I wanted to do. All I knew was I never wanted to work in a job again that I was so mismatched to me. Um, and I couldn't figure out what it would do, what to do. So in the meantime, I thought, well, I was doing belly dancing as a hobby. I have a notion that I might like teaching. I'll just ask, see if I can set up a class just to give me something to do. And the very first time I taught a class, I loved it. And I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to teach dancing. So I did what, you know, your average business consultant would do. I actually went to the state library where they held the ABS census data and I got out my little Malways map and I circled the, the suburbs that had the demographics that I thought would like classes. And then I looked up in the yellow pages, all of the belly dancing teachers, and I circled where they were. And I found the place that I could feasibly start classes. <laughs> I don't think any other belly dancer's has ever done that. <laughs> no, not, not even um, SEO people or not. Yeah, even, yeah that's, that's really granular <laughs> and technical, right? Okay. But, you know, um, in terms of from then onwards, I've kind of segued into different things when I've reached a different stage of my life. Like with the belly dancing, I ran a dance school and I was a performer at, you know, weddings and parties and things like that. I did that for almost 10 years, but then I had my daughter and the last thing I wanted to do as a mum of a young screaming child was to get glammed up and go out and go, ta-da, look at me, I'm gorgeous. I couldn't do it. <laughs> so then I kind of, you know, I was in entertainment. I was already running dance workshops for kids and adults. Um, so I went into kids' parties because it was related, but it was more where I was at at the time. Uh, and then from there, again, it was um, from after a while, the parties were just too exhausting. I was getting older. It was getting harder. <laughs> My life changed. I, um, my uh, ex-husband and I split up and I could no longer work weekends um, because I had my daughter with me full time. And so, again, I changed. Um, but 
through it all, it's always what I'll do is I'll find something that's of interest to me and then I'll look at, well, where, where, how can you get money out of this? And that's something, you know, that's a skill that I've learned because it's actually not easy to make a living out of creative things. So you have to put on your business hat as well as your creative hat and find the opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm just listening to your story and I'm just thinking, wow, somebody would have maybe given up, but you kept going, you you looked at whatever rocks were being thrown at you and you were building a wall, which is now... You know what, what it is, Prosper? Um, every now and again, I dip my toe back in the water of working for someone else and I get so bored. <laughs> well, it, it, I, I, it, it, it gives me the impetus to keep trying for myself. Well, that, that is absolutely amazing. Well, I was about to offer you to come and work with us, but then <laughs> considering you might get bored, I wouldn't want to put that on you. No, no. There's something that is coming up and it's the flavor of the month or topic of the month right now, which so happens to be an animal called chat GPT. And mm. obviously with the advent of AI, you have managed to really reconfigure yourself in the past and you've really managed to um, make use of what was available to you. What sort of, um, what does chat GPT present to you? First of all, as a copywriter, and second yeah. of all, uh, as somebody who's been in this space, um, you know, for this while. Yeah, it's, you know, ChatGPT is equal parts terrifying and exciting to me. I I waver between being scared of what's this going to do to my work and using it myself and going, this is so cool, this is so fun, it makes life easier. Um, and that side is winning out. I actually absolutely love it. And this is early iterations, but it is a little scary. Um, and I think that anybody who thinks that we can go on as normal and that, you know, chat, you know, people will say chat GPT is good for X, Y, Z, but it doesn't do this. You know, I always think yet chat GPT can't replace X, Y, Z. And I think yet. <laughs> um, I, I do, there is an absolute um, benefit in humans writing because chat GPT will, will deliver writing for you, but it won't necessarily have on that page it, all the important points or the things that are important to you. And as a writer, you think first, what's important to get down here? What are the things that my audience wants to hear? What's the message, the particular point that's going to really cut through? What order does it need to be written in to make it more enticing and take them through a story? Um, is it in the right tone of voice? And ChatGPT doesn't necessarily do all of those things particularly well at the moment. You, you can reiterate with it to get those things happening, like tone of voice. You can teach it or tell it to change things up a little bit and it can do that, but it's still requires a lot of human intervention to work out what do you want it to say and then to redo what it's done to make it good copy. Um, so we still need humans. And at the moment it can't, for example, write an about page about Prosper showing exactly what's special and unique about you because it doesn't interview you and talk to you and, and notice things about your personality that jump out. Um, it doesn't do that. But... I'm sure at some stage it will. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's the thing with I, I, I absolutely think this is game-changing stuff, not just chat GPT but AI in general. I have no doubt that this is as big as the internet. It is going to change the way everything's done and the speed at which things are coming out is incredible. You know, there's a new announcement from Google and Microsoft every single week there's new apps coming out every single day um, and what it can do is changing by the minute and the thing with this beast is it just learns faster and faster and faster. So who knows where it's going to land? <laughs> but, but at the same time, there is always opportunity, you know. There is, we've had new technology coming at us since the year zero and before that. Um, work changes. The output that you're expected to create to create changes how you do the stuff changes but 
people still want the same outputs and people will still pay for the out, for the outcome. You know, people will still pay to have a website, even though there's lots of different platforms where you can actually do it yourself. People will still pay to have graphic design outcomes, even if the graphic designer is using Canva. So there's still opportunity to, for people want other people to do stuff for them. You might be using a tool to do it. So that there's always going to be opportunity there, but it is definitely changing and we've got to change with it. Absolutely. See, what I got from that is we should actually stop calling it chat GPT. Guess what we're going to call it, Fiona? What? Chat GP yet. Yeah, because. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really funny. Like I've been, I've been listening to a lot of people talking about this stuff and trying to make predictions of what it's going to do. And the thing that strikes me is there's how the technology is developed and what it's developed to do, but there's also what humans do with it. You know, do you remember fax machines? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so fax machines were designed to send boring information from one office to another. But you know how they were very often used? Tradies sending photocopies of rude pictures to each other, <laughs> you know, sending jokes to each other. We... Tools, we've got these amazing graphic design tools online, but what do people do with them? They they create memes that look like they were made by a 10-year-old. You know, the way humans actually use technology and and create trends, we love novelty, we love playing, we love just doing anything different and new. So you cannot tell what direction stuff is going to go in because it'll change all the time and we'll do weird stuff. They, and then there's suddenly a market, there's suddenly an opportunity. Absolutely. You see, this thing has been opened up to 8 billion people, um, except, oh. except for the people in Italy and a few African countries that can't access it right now. So each and every yeah. one of those minds is going to have a say and an input in how yeah. they utilize that particular uh, product. And it's all going to be really, really exciting uh, moving forward. Now, I mean, obviously, there's so much that we can... Um, you know, unravel, especially from when you started and where things are going um, so far. Right now, if somebody wants to get a hold of you and sort of wants to uh, be in touch with what you're creating and maybe just keep, you know, in touch with your findings around SEO, around um, GPT and, and all the copywriting stuff, where will be the best place for people to uh, look for you? Right now on my social media, uh, which is Keep Up Copywriting, I have Facebook and I'm Fiona Stock on LinkedIn and they're probably the places where I connect and communicate the most. Um, I have a lead magnet on my website which goes to a news, uh, an email list and that is actually, I've got a free download of 20 lead magnet ideas for businesses. Um, so it gives them an idea of how to use a lead magnet and, and how they can or what what sort of lead magnet might be good for their particular type of business. And if you download that, you'll get onto my my email list. Yeah. But you know what? I'm I just like to, connecting with people by email, which is and and you know, through Messenger and so on. So if you look at keep up copywriting, um, just connecting with me directly is probably the best way to go about it. Because, you know, I write other people's newsletters and web um, and uh, social media and email opt-ins and that sort of stuff. But naturally, I don't keep up with it myself for my own business too much. <laughs> I like how your, your do business Do as I name say, is. not as I do. <laughs> Absolutely. I like how your business name is keep up, but you're not keeping up with. Yeah. Uh, M -M <laughs> well, it's like the chef that, you know, eats toast at home. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, <laughs> You've been through all of these things, 20 years, and it really shows your experience, you know, your 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 love of life and everything else that comes along um, with it. Can you maybe just give a bit of advice to other copywriters that are sitting right now thinking, oh, my God, my job has just been taken over by this AI um, or oh, people that are looking to break into this copywriting industry, mm. thinking maybe there's no use or there's no need for them to, uh, you know, get started on this, um, you know, sort of uh, wagon? 
Well, you know what? I have to start by saying I'm not the font of all wisdom on this because nobody is. You know, it's kind of a watch this space thing, but I think that is the crucial thing. Watch this space, experiment with it. We can't afford to sit back and just wait and see where this thing lands because it is going to keep on developing and changing. I think the best thing to do is get on ChatGPT, try some other tools that are out there, start using it and get familiar with it. Um, you know, it's it's like any other skill you can build up your ability to prompt it to create good copy. The first time you use it, you'll probably create a bit of rubbish, but you get better at it. I think that this is going to be a marketable skill um, that we can incorporate in our copywriting work. So, for example, one of the ways I use it, I write Facebook posts for a number of clients. They've got pretty boring businesses. I've been writing for a dentist maybe 8 to 12 posts a month for the last two, three years, and they all have to be different every single time. How many times can you say something exciting about a dentist, right? <laughs> but I find ChatGPT really helps me because I tell it to tell me a joke. I say, write a Facebook post that starts with a joke about X, Y, Z, or give me the top three funny reasons why you should go to the dentist, or tell me a fail story about not brushing your teeth, you know, and it actually comes up with witty stuff. And I'm getting feedback from my clients saying, wow, your posts are so interesting. <laughs> so the client still wants that outcome, which is to have their social media all written for them so they don't have to think about it. They don't care how I'm doing it. And this is actually helping me to deliver a better product for them or a better service for them. Um, so get onto it is the most important thing. But also I think, you know, with every any opportunity, the way that I spot, okay, how can I make money out of something that I want to do is eavesdropping on social media, seeing what people are talking about, what, what issues they're facing um, and sort of seeing what does the market want uh, and then working out, okay, how can I deliver that? What skills do I need? And I think that'll be the case with this. Um, a little while ago, I posted a question on a Facebook business women's group because all I was hearing of ChatGPT was from other copywriters and them using it. But I wanted to know, are other people actually using it? Are other businesses, my end customers using it? So I asked, what are you using it for and how? And just that gave me a wealth of information about well, what are people finding difficult, what are they using it for, and just from that I could see what some of the trends were and start thinking about, well, okay, where do I fit into this? Fantastic. I really appreciate your time today, and I was just listening to all the stuff that you're talking about, especially in the chat GPT space. Um, if I may just add, we have actually discovered a way that we can reverse engineer what our clients actually do and give it to them in a marketing plan. So we just go in and look at their testimonial, type it into chat GPT, just copy and paste and ask mm -hmm. chat GPT, what does this person do and what do the clients want that from them? And Brilliant. And, That's fantastic. And I'm chat impressed. GPT, yes. And chat GPT reverse engineers that testimonial, not only is the client's words being utilized, is their sentiments, how they actually arrive at that conclusion and what is it that they actually came to that person for. And I kid you not, it has really, really, really um, streamlined the way we actually deliver our service. So it's no longer about Love it. Or, or what you know, it's now about implementation. How are you actually making the, the most use um, you know, of this uh, tool and how are you putting it out there in order for you to be doing and have a business that's yeah, profitable yeah. and enjoyable. And now I think there'll, there'll be a certain portion of the market that this knocks out for us, that there will be people that decide to use this tool to do stuff themselves. But when I asked that question in the Facebook group, everybody that said that they were using it in their businesses now also said that I wouldn't have hired a copywriter anyway. They were the people that like to do things for themselves. You know, like I design a lot of stuff in Canva. I'm not a graphic designer, but I've got enough skills to do it. So, um, but on the, so I'm not going to hire a graphic designer, but on the other hand, I will never do any gardening or DIY around my house. I will just pay somebody to take that problem off my hands. 
So, <laughs> so I think, you know, there's, there's going to be a certain element of people that um, we are going to lose a little bit of work to or certain kinds of work to. But um, there's always going to be people that just want you to do it and now you can do it better and deliver something a bit exciting like what you're talking about. Um, yeah, quicker, faster, better, et cetera. The race is on. <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> Absolutely. I just got a wink from our producer saying we're running out of tape. Fiona, I think we need to do another episode. Well, it's been great talking to you and I love a good old chin wag, so I'd be happy to. <laughs> and that's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. If you're watching this uh, podcast on YouTube, just be sure to give us a like, a comment or a review and also subscribe if that's what your platform allows you to. I can't thank Fiona uh, for her time today and um, especially when we caught her in between her belly dancing practice. <laughs> I just really appreciate what um, she brought to the table, especially redefining what ChatGPT is, especially by calling it ChatGP yet. All right. So yeah, I like that one. <laughs> that's that's it from us today. And uh, if you've got any questions, comments, or requests for what we should bring to the table, just uh, be sure to put them in the comments below. Until next time. Please help me thank Fiona for her time on the online prosperity experience today. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>